research manager. Um, so uh, you see we have our presentation up in front of you today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the Community Mitigation Fund. Uh, Lily, why don't you give me the, the next page on that? Um, so we'll just go, um, just a, a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, we are recording this meeting, uh, so it will be uh, put up on our website uh, after we're done today. So if anyone does want to review it or if there's anyone else who um, uh, you think should view it, uh, it will be available. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a, a break uh, for questions at the end of each major section of the, of the uh, agenda. Um, and, uh, but you can also utilize the chat function um, at any time. So if, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, if you scroll over that, you'll see a chat button. Uh, feel free to uh, type in questions there as we go. Um, and we'll keep an eye on that and try to uh, jump in on those as, as they are, uh, as it makes sense. Uh, we do, I see we have a few people on the phone, not too many, um, but for those folks, uh, we did send out uh, copies of the PowerPoint to folks yesterday, and hopefully you have them. So you can, if you're on the phone, you can maybe follow along on your computer. Uh, but also, um, we got we just got a question. Is the sound coming through garbled, or uh, how, how does it sound, Mary, on your end? It sounds fine. OK. Um, so for people on the phone, um, you need to use the star six function to mute and unmute your phone. Um, and also, I guess we just asked everyone to, to keep their their uh, their phones, uh, uh, their, their screens muted um, unless asking questions. All right, next slide, uh, Lily. So for the agenda today, um, you know, we've got a, a, a bunch of new things for this year and we're really gonna try to focus on those as much as possible. Um, we will go through, so on uh, the item number one, we have uh, an overview of, of the, the community mitigation fund. Um, and we'll talk about the fund itself a little bit and, and the timeline, how that will all work. Um, we also have some changes to our budget sheet. So we're gonna go over that. We'll talk about our waivers a little bit. Um, uh, and then we're gonna talk, we'll talk about our grant categories in general. We're not gonna go into a tremendous amount of detail on those grant categories that we've been doing for the last uh, number of years. We'll talk about them a little bit, um, but uh, we will wanna talk um, about the new categories that we have at more length. So the, the second part of this will be uh, what we're calling our gambling harm reduction category. Um, and, and this is something that uh, came out of last year's uh, grant round. We, we did have an application to, to try to do uh, some gambling harm reduction. And, um, you know, as it turns out, it wasn't quite ready for prime time when, when it came in. And, uh, but it did get us to thinking about maybe that's something that we should think about doing. And uh, in fact, have proposed it for this year. And then the, the third major part of this is, um, what we're calling projects of regional significance, um, which I will present uh, to you on, on that a little bit later in the, um, in the program. So a little bit about the Community Mitigation Fund. Again, we're not gonna go into a whole lot of depth on, on the basis of the program. We've been doing this now since 2015. So I think uh, um, most of you folks are, are, are familiar with the program at least a little bit. Um, so of course the, the, the legislation that established the uh, expanded gaming in the Commonwealth created this community mitigation fund um, to help support uh, the communities and other governmental entities uh, in offsetting uh, impact costs related to the construction and operation of the gaming facilities. Uh, so now obviously we are well into the operations phase of these, there really isn't any uh, construction impact per se um, that's happening at this point. So 6.5% of the taxes uh, on gross gaming revenue uh, from the category one facilities, those are the full uh, resort casinos, those go into the community mitigation fund. Um, so for 2023, uh, we've identified as available funds, uh, $20 million in region A and just uh, region A is our Eastern region, the uh, communities around uh, the Encore facility. Uh, We've identified $7 million in Region B, which is the Western region around the, the communities around the MGM facility, 
And we also do set aside uh, some money for the category two facility, which is the Plain Ridge Park uh, facility. Um, those communities, while, while Plain Ridge Park doesn't contribute to um, the community mitigation fund, those communities are still eligible. So we set aside a relatively small amount of money uh, for those communities. And, and you might notice that there's a fairly large disparity uh, between what's available in region A and region B. And this is um, came out of our subcommittee on community mitigation and our local community mitigation advisory committees uh, where the, the, the commission has agreed that funds that are generated uh, by the facility in region A would stay in region A and the funds generated uh, in region B would stay in region B. Now, you know, the Encore facility right now generates about, uh, in the last year, generated about $10.5 million of funds towards the community mitigation fund, while the MGM property uh, generated just a little over 4 million. So you'll see that, uh, you know, regionally, uh, you know, the Encore facility is bigger and, and it is around a much larger population center. So it has higher gaming revenues, which means it has a higher amount of money that goes into the uh, community mitigation fund. So that's why there's this sort of uh, disparity in, in, in the funds for the regions. Now, you'll also notice that, um, you know, I said uh, Encore generated about 10 and a half million uh, in, in the last year, but there's 20 million available. This means that, that monies from previous years haven't been completely expended. Um, and same thing in Region B with, uh, with MGM generating about 4 million, there's about 7 million available in the region because of uh, some carryover funds from previous years. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Lily and she'll go over uh, the timeline of our grant cycle and what you can expect over the next uh, year or so. Thank you. So, oh, can you hear me? All set? Okay. <laughs> so um, as of November, our grant round is currently open. If you haven't already seen that, I think we sent out an email to everyone on this call. So you can currently access all of the applications as well as the guidelines for this year on both our website and Combi's. These applications are gonna be due January 31st at 1159, uh, and you're gonna be emailing them directly to the commission at the listed email, uh, MGCCMF. Um, and Mary will go into that um, bit of good news a little bit later. Uh, so for our process, you know, we accept these grants in, by January and starting in February, we work with myself, Joe, Mary, and some other members of the commission to review all of the grants that come in uh, and help make some determinations and some suggestions for the commission. Uh, at this point, if we have any questions about your application, we'll be contacting you after our first initial round of review, um, just asking for supplemental information, or if uh, you know we think we need a little bit more explanation, we'll sit down and ask for a meeting. Um, so we will then take our review to the commissioners and they will um, vote on these. Uh, we usually get them done before the end of the fiscal year. So they're usually um, voted on in late spring. Uh, and then in June and July, we'll be um, sending out contracts to anyone that was awarded funding. So you can expect that in fall of 2023 is when your grants should be starting. Uh, and just to make it abundantly clear, you should not be applying for funding for things that will occur before a grant is executed. So if your grant happens, you know, if we get all of our contracts together, um, we'll send it out in June, you get it back to us in June, you'll be eligible to start reimbursing as of the date on your executed contract. Uh, Joe, I see you unmuted, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I just, just wanted to add on to that. I think that, you know, we can also be flexible a little bit in this. In some cases, we can uh, move a grant faster if it needs to move faster. Um, I know some in the past, some of our workforce grants, we've advanced those quicker because the, those groups work on, on a fiscal year and, and sort of need to have their grants in place, you know, by the beginning of July. But also, even if it's under the regular uh, time frame, if, if a community is ready to go, you know, we'll get you out the grant documents as quick as we can. We can be we can be pretty flexible on, on how quickly we can move to get some of this stuff done. Yeah, but we do ask if you are looking for an expedited timeline that you reach out to us in advance to let us know, um, just so that when we're organizing which grants we prioritize in um, order of review, that we can get those grants reviewed earlier. So. 
Okay, so I'm going to just talk briefly on the application submission. Uh, I want you to know we did listen to you. Um, people were frustrated trying to submit their application through Combi's. So this year we're having you send them directly to us at the website, mgccmf at massgaming.gov. Um, uh, when an application is received by us, you'll be getting a receipt back, uh, but the, the applications themselves will not be opened until February 1st. Uh, so any, anyone sending in an application by, you know, 11.59 on January 31st will meet the application deadline. And any applicant having difficulty in submitting their application should contact us where we try to be very open and uh, we hope that you will feel free to give us a call about any questions that you may have regarding your applications. A uh, couple of things we'd like people to note is that we would like applicants to be sure that, that you are applying under the correct category. Now, if you have a, say you're applying for a grant that exceeds the uh, the guidelines uh, recommended amount, such as the community planning grants, which are 200,000, say you get an estimate and it comes in at 240, um, you should still file your application under that category. But what we have in place is a waiver process. So what you would need to do would be to fill out the waiver and submit it with your application and the waiver should uh, describe why you feel the commission should give you a waiver on this uh, particular matter. Uh, and I think that's it. Yeah, I think just adding on to that, Mary, a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, last year we had, you know, a couple couple years ago when we started doing uh, public safety applications, they were a subset of our our specific impact grant and. Uh, in some of the ensuing years, folks have applied rather than applying under the new public safety category, they were applying under specific impact. And we had last year, we just had a, a number of applications that came in uh, in uh, really not the right category. So one of the things that we did in the guidelines this year is we reserve the right to if you know if you apply for something under the wrong category, uh, we can move it into the right category uh, so so that it just doesn't get you know. Uh, dismissed out of hand. Oh, and I did want to just highlight, um, this year we're trying to get more concise applications also. So if you have data that you want to relay to us, we would prefer to get a summary of the data rather than getting say 50 pages of reports. Um, we, you, you've got to understand that if we get 50 applications times 20 pages, that's still quite a lot of reading. <laughs> but, and we, we don't really, uh, we want people to be precise in their applications if you can. Um, the attachments must be uh, addressed in the application and it, it would be helpful if you would make sure that on your attachments, somewhere on there, it has a reference to the applicant. So if you could put at the top, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, Town of Weston um, Community Planning Grant. If you could put that on there just so, and that that's just because we're going to be getting a lot of paperwork and a lot of attachments, and we want to make sure that we have everything as complete as possible. Okay. Next is we're going to hear from Lily on budget. Great. So um, on that point of concise applications, this year we're asking that in um, that you fill out. We've uh, we've <laughs> we've gathered together all of our best budgets that we've had in the previous years and kind of determined what was the easiest way for our review team to actually look at budgets. So we determined that in order to develop a scope budget and timeline, we'd like you to actually fill out this sheet. This is a screenshot of about half of the sheet where you will outline exactly what you want out of your budget and what your budget is covering, as well as a proposed timeline. Um, previously, we just had some applications where they were submitting a budget. There was a different number in the narrative. So just to make it more concise on our end, 
Um, this will be what we use to, um, to review your budget. And you can, uh, as noted here, feel free to attach any consultant scopes, any invoices, quotes, anything that you have on these pieces. But, uh, and you can also submit if there's a different kind of budget you wanna submit, but you must fill out this budget. Um, so this is something new for this year. And then what will happen is in the fall, if there is an update that needs to happen to your budget, we'll just re-update this budget form so that we can keep on track of what's happening with everyone's budgets in a little bit more of a concise way. Okay, so, um, you know, for, you know, we've learned a lot over the last number of years, but so, you know, what does a successful application look like? Um, you know, we do ask that uh, each of you, you know, review the Community Mit Mitigation Fund guidelines. Um, those were attached, I believe, to all of your um, invitations to this meeting um, as well. So, uh, you know, you can also on our website, you can look at previously awarded grants. Um, that can give you some ideas of, of uh, things that you might want to apply for. Again, we mentioned earlier filing the application under the correct category. Um, you know, I think the, the, the uh, guidelines list out a, a whole bunch of different things that you can uh, file under. Look, if you have a real question about what category you should be filing under, we'd be happy to have a, have a chat with you about that. Um, also to fill out all of the forms thoroughly and completely. Um, and then, you know, the, the two critical things on all of these, all of these items is first is, you know, identifying and documenting the impact of the gaming establishment. Um, you know, in, in the community planning grants, we have, we've made that a little bit simpler uh, uh, in, in, in the way we, we've sort of determined that some, there are some impacts of the gaming establishment, but in other areas, the applicant really has to clearly identify what the impact is and explain how the proposed uh, project will address that very specific impact that you've identified. Um, if you do those two things well, um, that takes you a long way in getting in getting the um, the grant. You know, I would say that in most of the cases where we have not awarded a grant, it is because of that uh, establishing that connection to the uh, to the uh, gaming establishment. Okay, and this is back to Mary. Yes. Yeah, so we, we kind of touched on this already, but I'll just, uh, I want to let you know that the commission may in its discretion waive or grant a variance for many of the provisions required in the guidelines. Um, so we would like, and these uh, waivers can be used both for money, but it could also be for a time frame. So a lot of, a lot of uh, people, uh, are noticing the the, uh, the COVID delay, I'm gonna call it, of getting equipment and other things. And um, if you are getting a bunch of quotes or having trouble getting quotes, um, but you want to uh, continue with your application, you know, fill out the waiver form. As long as it's uh, well-written and explains why you feel that a waiver should be granted, that would be, uh, that's great. Um, let's see. So we already discussed how some applicants pick categories by funding available, um, when in reality, what they really should have done was to uh, fill out a waiver form. Um, we, all, we also already mentioned that we were grants taken out of order. Um, but we just would like everyone to communicate with, with staff on if you have any questions about waivers or variances or you know, being taken out of order. We try and be uh, open to questions and you all now have our emails. So we hope to hear from you. Uh, the next is discussing available grants. All right, let me get my notes, okay. So, um, the first thing I'd like to suggest everyone do who has not done it yet would be to read the guidelines. It, the guidelines really are essential because they help you evaluate the criteria for each different type of grant. And it, um, 
and if you go on our website also and review the previously six previous successful applications, that's a good way to help you um, maybe shape some of your applications if, if you're wondering how to uh, go about it. Um, the first grant we're going to discuss real briefly is the community planning grant. And the, as Joe mentioned, the, the um, commission has already determined that casinos have both positive and negative impacts. Applicants still need to show the nexus to the casino, um, but it's not as intensive. Okay, we could. All right, we have, I have a question. Is the cap for a project or the total available in that category? It's the, the caps are the total amounts in that category. No, I mean, I think that's, the, that's a, if that's cap for a particular project. Is the cap for, oh, is the cap yeah. for a project or the total? So, so if, if, and, someone, oh, I'm sorry. if someone came in for a community planning grant, you could come in for a grant up to $200,000. Right. Does that answer your question, Chief? Um, some examples, um, some examples of uh, some great uses for the community planning grants are we've done a lot with tourism, we've done websites, marketing such as branding, um, uh, videos. If you look under the Foxborough Plainville Rentham uh, application, they, they've done a great job with their branding and website. Um, Northampton uh, and uh, websites to assist travelers that you're trying to attract to your region. That's also another oh, good uh, community planning grant. Okay, can a different project, uh, oops, let me just one moment. All right, can different projects under community planning total the funding cap? Yes. Yes. Yeah, if you, had, if you had a couple of different types of planning projects that you wanted to do and each was 100,000, you could, you could do that, but the, you know, the cap would be the 200,000 for the community. Yeah. Okay, um, next is the public safety. And we've raised this from uh, 100,000. It was, uh, it was formerly 100,000, now it's 200,000. And it's found in section 2.2 of the guidelines. And this is used to supplement departmental budgets of the police, fire, EMS, and other public safety agencies that may have been impacted by the casinos. Examples of uses are for officer training, public safety equipment or supplies, equipment upgrades. Um, there is one with, with the public safety uh, comes one additional step if you're looking for uh, uh, communication equipment. Um, the communication equipment has to go through the statewide interoperability executive committee, that's a mouthful. Um, there's a form that has to get filled out and submitted to them. And this agency just makes sure that if, uh, if you're a police department, that your equipment is going to match all the other equipment within the state other state police offices within the state of Massachusetts police offices. Um, uh, some of the uh, really, uh, the commission is very enthusiastic about de-escalation and other types of mandated officer trainings. Uh, we also uh, will expend funding for operational costs and supplies such as, you know, uh, traffic cones, things like that. Uh, communities that have been very successful with these type of uh, projects are Foxborough, Springfield, and Everett, if you wanna check out the previous uh, applications submitted by them. And next, we're gonna go down to transportation planning. Now that again, we've raised that limit um, from 200 to 250. It's found in section 2.3 of the guidelines. These transportation planning grants, they must have a defined area of issue and a clear plan for implementation. 
and the planning grants are intended to assist in the gathering of data and include the hiring of consultants. Planning uh, such as is, uh, Chelsea has been very successful with the transportation planning. Um, they, they, uh, their applications uh, went along a whole progression. They used their reserve for some initial planning and then they developed it into transportation planning and then they did transportation construction. So one just helped feed off the other. Um, the, uh, the planning is also uh, to assist communities getting into maybe the tip, maybe if you need seed money to assist your community in getting some uh, work into the state's tip fund. Uh, that, that's another good way to use transportation planning. Next, we have transportation construction, which is a maximum of 1.5 million. And it's, on, it's found under section 2.4 of the guidelines. And these are mostly intended for construction of transportation related improvements. Uh, construction, we do uh, try and set a time frame for these transportation construction. And we, uh, the project must start by 6.30.24. Um, so we, we give a lot of time, but we, do, we don't want this money just sitting somewhere. We want it to, um, to, to be used. Um, uh, commute, uh, a recent uh, transportation construction grant was given to Agawam for an intersection redesign. And again, the um, Beecham Street Chelsea matter is that transportation construction project is, is pretty well done. And if anyone has a chance to go to Chelsea, um, it's amazing the difference this, this the transportation construction and the whole their whole development of these grants made in that particular area. Um, these can be used for paving. We also did um, uh, quite a ways on down Dwight Street in Springfield. Uh, but I do want you to note that the transportation construction grants are not used to cover planning, transportation planning. Those belong in the transportation planning. These are more construction related. The next grant we have is the- Mary, Mary if I could just jump in there real quick. Yeah. Um, and also on the transportation construction side, we will only fund up to one third of the total project cost. So uh, if you were to get the full 1.5 million, it would be on a, you know, four and a half million dollar project. Um, and also just uh, in both transportation planning and construction, another uh, category that we've done quite a bit of work in is on uh, multi-use trails, bike paths and things like that. Oh, yes, I forgot about those. Okay. Is the funding cap for all public safety departments combined or can each... Okay, yeah, they, um, that's combined for your community. Yes, yeah. Yep, yep. So each public safety department within a municipality of site. Um, yeah, the funding cap is for all. They can, you can get a, a you know, police could apply for 100,000, fire department could apply for 100,000. Um, that's how that works. All right, next we're in workforce development. Um, and with these, these have been very successful in training persons and getting a backlog of workers into the workforce. Um, applicants must be able to demonstrate that the education and skills training programs are proposed, proposed or in response to an identified need at the casinos or as a means to provide sufficient supply of workers to backfill jobs being lost to the casino. Um, we want to emphasize too that um, a regional consortium approach is required. Um, the, the two major uh, applicants we've gotten, Holyoke Community College and uh, Mass Hire, uh, work with a number of other, other educational agencies and develop their uh, grants together. And um, it's really, I think, been a great uh, 
great program for really hitting all the different areas of need for education in Region A and Region B. Uh, next is the specific impacts grants, which are for a maximum of 500,000. It's found under section 2.6 of the guidelines. And these are for projects that don't really fit any other category. They must provide a thorough description of the identified impact and a resolution to the impact. Um, and an example of this, um, Every year for a number of years, we've gotten um, Hamden County Sheriff's Department, which it was forced to relocate as a result of where their facility was, which is right in the middle of the MGM uh, property. Um, and they receive uh, rental assistance in their uh, specific impact. And next we have, um, I'm gonna just barely touch on the next two because we have um, some experts here. Uh, projects of regional significance. Uh, this is a new one with uh, 3 million for region B and uh, what is it, five for region A. Uh, you'll find it under section 2.7 of the guidelines. And it's designed to mitigate identified gaming impacts that affect multiple communities. Um, and this could be uh, the focus. Well, I'll let Joe go into those. I will. <laughs> um, and then the next two are the gambling harm reduction, which are brand new this year. And they're really community engaged research projects. And you can see we have two different types, one for 20,000 and one for 200,000. And I will let uh, Mark Vanderlinden and Bonnie uh, will fill you in more on those. Great, Next and just to, wrap up, oh, just to wrap up this section, um, this year we decided to increase our regional incentives. If you're applying for a community planning or transportation planning application, um, you can combine that application with another um, community that might be neighboring and impacted by the same thing. Uh, for example, Mary had pointed to one that we had three communities down in um, the Plainville area come in and apply for something and got a regional incentive. So um, you can just see outlined here, these are the increases. Uh, and again, we really love to see group projects. Okay, I know we got a bunch of questions that we had during the uh, presentation. Does anyone have anything else that they'd like to ask at this point on the sort of the basic program before we get into our uh, new types of grants? Okay. Um, all right, well, why don't we go on? So, so for the new for 2023, Mary just touched on this. We have those the two uh, in the gambling harm reduction uh, categories. Oh, we just did have a question pop in. How are projects judged against one another? Um, well, we, we have a set of uh, evaluation criteria that we use that are, they are outlined in the guidelines. Um, and that's essentially on each one of these projects, we, we evaluate them against each other in, in each category. Um, and then, um, you know, we use the evaluation criteria that's in our guidelines to, to guide that uh, discussion. Um, and then we ultimately, we make recommendations to the commission who then vote on each of the applications. Um, okay, and then the, the other category is the projects of regional significance. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark and to uh, Bonnie to talk about our uh, gambling our reduction program for it this year. Great, actually, Bonnie, do you wanna go ahead and uh, take the lead on this? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Bonnie Andrews. I'm the research manager at the Gaming Commission. Um, and I was just gonna go over the gambling harm reduction grants. Um, and Mark, feel free to jump in at any time if there's anything you wanna add, anything I'm skipping over, anything like that. 
Um, but I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of a background in terms of the harm reduction grants and say um, that the commission is seeking to study and mitigate gambling related harms through this new pilot program. Um, and this pilot program will provide funding for a limited number of what we're calling community engaged research projects. Um, and that the objective of community engaged research is to more deeply understand specific negative or unintended impacts of casino gambling at a community level. Um, the specific research topic or question should be developed through a community driven process. Um, so the project should be contextual to their city, town and neighborhood and should highlight unique aspects of the community. Um, so what we're asking is when you're thinking about who you want on your research team, um, as well as the overall approach to the project, you should consider the principles of community based participatory research. Um, and what community based participatory research is, is it focuses on social, structural and physical environmental inequities through the active involvement of community members, organizational representatives and researchers in all aspects of the research process. So that basically means that all partners working on the project contribute their expertise to enhance understanding of a given phenomenon and integrate the knowledge gained with action to benefit the community involved. So basically, it's partners working within the community, um, working together to more deeply understand specific negative or unintended impacts of casino gambling at a community level. Um, this also means that something important to note is that we cannot fund nonprofits directly. Um, the research is meant to be community driven, um, so interested nonprofits should work collaboratively with the municipality to apply, um, and that the application must come from the municipality directly actually for two levels of assistance. Um, so type one is for the development or planning of a study um, or project. And type two we're thinking of is more for the implementation of a project. Um, so for type one, if the applicant is really going to be developing a plan to engage the community to identify a casino or gambling related topic or issue which warrants further investigation. And type two, um, applicants that have a specific research topic and or question um, and are prepared um, to propose a research strategy would be I'm um, applying for type two funding. Um, okay. Okay, so to go into um, a little bit more detail is that um, type one we're seeing as a planning study. Um, and what we're really seeing this as seed funding to shape a research question. And you can use the funding for costs like consultants, focus groups, um, preliminary review of kind of secondary data that's available in your community, um, conducting a literature review into the background of the problem. Um, those are kinds of things that you can use type one funding for to plan your project. Um, and the product of this process should be a research strategy which may be considered for type two funding in subsequent funding cycles. Um, we expect these grants to be a one year term. Um, and so an example of a final product from this funding would be um, a brief report discussing the question, finding and process. And then for type two, um, this is actually sort of intended for implementation we're thinking of this as. Um, and this is for applicants that have a specific research topic and or question and are prepared to propose a research strategy. Um, so essentially, the applicants need to have um, a full research proposal, and that includes these following sections. Um, so what we're really looking at is for you to have specific aims and the specific aims um, essentially state concisely the goals of the proposed research and I'll have an example of specific aims for a type two type of project later on in the presentation. Um, you'll be summarizing the gambling related harms and potential impacts that the results of the proposed project will exert on, um, on your community and the research fields involved. The research strategy involves providing a detailed research strategy, which includes the following. So your approach, um, describing the overall strategy, methodology and analyses to be used to accomplish the specific aims of the project, um, the significance of the project. So explaining the importance of the topic or question that the proposed project addresses. Um, innovation, so any newer novel theoretical concepts, approaches or methodologies to be used. Um, and also protection of human subjects. So if you need to um, summarize the plan to protect human subjects and obtain IRB approval. 
There's also a section on collaboration and knowledge of the community. So describing the organization's relationship with each other and understanding of the community with whom the study will take place and also knowledge translation and exchange. So how an answer to the question or insight on the topic may mitigate gambling related harms in the community. Um, identify specific activities and or measures which may be supported by the community mitigation fund in subsequent funding cycles. Um, and describe a plan to share information with the community um, and or use it to inform policy or practice. Um, so that's a little bit uh, more about type two funding. Um, and we also have a couple of questions. Um, uh, Bonnie, why, don't, why don't we stop here before we get into the Asian care study and, and address the questions that came in. Um, so the first question that we got was, can we apply to investigate slash research further incidents of DFSA at Encore clubs? I'm not sure I know what DFSA means. Um, Daily fantasy sports. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that right? Oh, drug facilitated sexual assaults. Um, I, I don't, I'm not really sure. I think we'd have to, we'd have to see what a proposal would be, but I mean, this is really for, for gambling harm reduction. And, and I don't think it's really dealing with the, the clubs or not. I don't know, Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Honestly, Joe, I, I I think it would be it would be worth exploring. I mean, it's it's uh, isn't community mitigation funding. It it's really not necessarily about. It doesn't necessarily have to be gambling specific, but perhaps the effect of the casino within within the community and and for category one, um, it, it's the entire gaming establishment. I I'm I'm winging it here. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a, proposal. Um, maybe police? Would that be something that would be more public safety? Well, well, you know, we did fund last year under public safety. We funded some money for the city of Boston for their um, um, uh, their human trafficking unit. Yes. Yeah. So, so it might be something that could fall under a public safety category potentially, um, or something to that effect. So, so I think there certainly would be some possibilities around that. Um, but I think obviously we'd need to see more, more detail on the application of what it would look like. I'm intrigued. Yeah, I think it's helpful to know that this is a new category for us as well. Um, so if you want to reach out to program staff with your idea, um, I think we'd be happy to kind of look it over and, uh, you know, think a little bit more on our end about what that could be. And I think, so the other question was, can harm reduction funding be used for incentives? Um, I guess that depends what the incentives are. I mean, if that, if that's talking about uh, payments directly to people for like participating and things like that, that's probably not allowable under the program. Um, you know, this is, this is designed. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm really, I, I can't say for sure, but cause I'm not exactly, oh, gift cards, refreshments, et cetera. Yeah, I think we have allowed where people, if they're holding a meeting, you know, they can provide refreshments and things like that. Um, that's probably something that would be allowable. Um, we'd like you to, you know, outline it in your application of what it, what it is that you're proposing to do. And, how much you're proposing to spend and so on. Um, but that's something that might be um, that might be allowable. And yeah, we, I, I don't think about gift cards, so that yeah, yeah, that's that may be something if you I mean maybe you could go to the casino because the casinos are supposed to be expending funding for things like gift cards and stuff for the public. So maybe if someone is thinking about gift cards, they should go to Encore and maybe ask them about it. Yeah, I think, well, we would have to think yeah, about that one a little bit. Yeah, I can, I yeah, can it's, give a direct it's, answer. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't we, why don't we move on, uh, Bonnie, to the Asian care study. Okay. So this, um, the Asian care study is an example of the kind of a project that um, can be, um, that can be considered for type two funding or the scope of a project that would be a type two kind of project. 
um, and Asian Cares, or the Center for Addressing Research, Education, and Services Project, is a coalition of ethnic-based, community-based organizations in the greater Boston region, providing linguistically and culturally appropriate services. Um, and essentially, um, this group conducted in-depth qualitative research in partnership with Tufts Clinical and Translational Science Institute to expand understanding of how problem gambling manifests in Asian families in order to inform the development of culturally and linguistically appropriate tools and community-based resources for prevention and early intervention efforts. So I'm not going to read everything on the slide, but this basically sort of talks about um, the study rationale and sort of background and motivation for the study. Um, and again, as an example of um, a study kind of um, partnership. Okay. And that this is an example of specific aims that you would include in a research study. Um, Okay, and actually, oh, there are, um, okay. So there are um, specific aims, um, which were, you can see the four specific aims here. And again, I'm not gonna read all of them, but an example of um, a specific aim, aim one, would be review the state of the science, strategically selecting bodies of literature relevant to gambling problems in Asian communities and family-centered approaches to resiliency, prevention, and harm mitigation. Um, so you can see that kind of like each of the specific aims talks a little bit about um, what the study aims to do. Um, and they also provided information on um, the overall um, objectives of the study, which were to inform the development of tools and resources to support tailored education, treatment referral, and other harm reduction efforts among at-risk and hard-to-reach um, Asian American populations. Um, so again, you can kind of look over this on the slide in more detail, but I just kind of wanted to provide an opportunity um, to look specifically at what specific aims might look like in this, kinds of, um, this kind of an application. And this gives more detail about the research process. Um, so what they did was they recruited bilingual and bicultural community field workers conducting 40 in-depth qualitative interviews to better understand the nature and impact of problem gambling. Participants were community members from the Cambodian, Chinese, Korean, and Vietnamese communities. And they also reviewed the state of the science relevant to gambling problems in Asian communities and looked nationally at a few existing programs. Um, they identified existing resources within a coalition of organizations assisting Asian immigrants and refugees and Asian American families in Boston's Chinatown and surrounding communities that can be leveraged to engage hard to reach and at risk populations. Um, and the research findings, again, I'm not gonna go over all of the research findings in detail, but the reason that there are different colors um, on the, of the text on the slides is basically because I wanted to highlight a couple of research findings. And then on the next slide, it talks about kinds of recommendations um, for mitigation um, related to the research findings. Um, so the couple of research findings that I was going to highlight here are one of the research findings was that there is a lack of economic opportunity propels many to turn to gambling as an alternative source or to supplement income. And social and cultural isolation due to immigration results in a lack of social and recreational opportunities often expressed as boredom. Um, so on the next slide, um, it's, it talks about um, suggested implementable solutions for the research findings. So um, those that are highlighted here are developing programs geared towards helping working class immigrants gain the language and occupational skills needed to acquire meaningful employment with benefits and wages, um, invest in the neighborhoods where immigrants work, live, and play by creating spaces of belonging where communities can meet for safe recreational and social opportunities, and develop a steering committee of key community leaders to guide the development of policy, practice, and services around addressing the root causes of problem gambling. So again, what they did is they had a bunch of different research findings, um, and they also had suggested implementable solutions, um, for recommendations related to those research findings. And um, questions? 
Oh, and actually I had a couple of other things I wanted to highlight before getting to the questions, um, which was to make sure to contact the community affairs staff with any questions or if you have questions about your application in advance of the deadline. Um, definitely recommend that you read the guidelines because there's kind of more detail about each of the components of the application. Um, and also that we have a website. Um, if you go to the ma uh, massgaming.com and you go to the research agenda, um, there are examples of community engaged research projects there to kind of give you some ideas is about um, different things you may want to explore in your community and different kinds of projects that have been done. Great, thank you, Bonnie, that was great. Um, and so we and do have, a, oh, go ahead, Mark, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, I don't want, so this is a new, new line of funding through the Community Mitigation Fund, but this uh, funding for community-based or community-engaged participatory research um, has been a, available for quite some time with funding through the public health trust fund, you know, same source of revenue, um, but a different a different fund, and that's where you know, the Asian Cares study was funded. And as you'll see, if you you go to the research page, you'll see a whole host of other uh, research that's been funded out of the public health trust fund, including um, several community uh, engaged research studies. So, just wanted to kind of provide some clarification there. Great. So we did have a couple questions come in. Um, one person, I may have missed it, but for the gambling harm reduction studies, do we need to partner with a university slash research partner? If not, can you talk more about how we engage in IRB process? Um, so, you know, these are, these will be driven, you know, initially by the communities, the communities have to apply for this. And I think, you know, for the planning study, I'm not sure there necessarily has to be a, a researcher that's that's directly involved. It could be consultants or it could be some of your own research. It could be, you know, doing some focus groups, you know, from your, your local board of health or, you know, health agent. Um, but I do think when you get to the larger studies, we are talking about partnering with some, uh, some sort of a research partner. Would you agree with that, Mark? Yeah, I think that's well said, Jeff. Okay. Um, and I think most of these other uh, questions were, were regarding whether, what incentives we could provide. And I think we would have to look into that a little bit more before saying yeah, I think whether or not that would be eligible. One of, I think it was Brenda made a, a point that oftentimes um, incentives of some sort are involved if you're wanting to engage the, uh, the community. And I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think it's just, we, we would need to figure out a way that would satisfy uh, Lily's point that's also made in that thread. Yeah, and I think we, you know, we, have to, we have to bounce that off our legal department, I think internally um, to, to really ask that question. But uh, you know, I know in the past in some of our workforce grants, we have allowed um, you know, bus passes to be provided to folks um, and things like that. You know, uh, people who couldn't afford to, uh, you know, to, to didn't have vehicles so they could use public transportation to get to classes and so on. Um, so, you know, you know, again, it may or may not be, but we'll, we'll look into that and, and, you know, we'll try to get out some, some guidance on whether we think that's allowable or not. Okay. Oh, thanks, Rachel. That's uh, UMass has a process for monitoring gift cards. Um, other, any other questions from folks um, regarding the um, gambling harm reduction? Okay. Um, so our next new category um, is project. And thanks, Mark and Bonnie. Do appreciate your time and uh, great presentation. Um, so projects of regional significance. Th this um, started actually a, a few years ago, we, we started thinking about this, is that is there a way to sort of leverage some of these community mitigation funds to uh, projects that are, are uh, more transformational? Um, and that picture there, I, I asked Lily to put in a nice picture of the big dig for us so we could see something that's really transformational, uh, probably not gonna be funding anything like that uh, with these grants. Um, but what we did in this year is we realized that um, 
some of these larger scale projects that are already in the pipeline might also address casino related impacts. And you know, the example that we used as a fictional example um, in the guidelines was that if um, if MassDOT were proposing to do a project that was going to uh, a, con a congestion mitigation project that was going to increase capacity on the roadway, um, and it was adjacent to one of the casinos, um, you know, that would also address traffic related impacts associated with the casino. So we could theoretically uh, provide some money towards a project like that. And so we, we took it a little bit further and we met with the regional planning agencies and we met with MassDOT and um, everybody really liked this idea. So we decided that we would try this as a, at least as a pilot program for this first year. Um, so the basic premise of this is that, that this needs to be a project that's regional in nature but it must also at the same time mitigate a casino related impact. Now, I think in our mind, in the back of our minds, we were thinking more on the order of transportation or transit projects, but any project that's eligible under the, um, under the, the expanded gaming act would be, would be eligible for these. And some of these things that are identified are transportation, infrastructure, housing, education, public safety, um, now, we haven't really thought about how, you know, for instance, no one has ever come into the Community Mitigation Fund for housing, um, because it's, it's hard to make a connection between housing and, and an impact from the casino, you know, has, um, and I think even uh, we, we've done some studies on housing prices and or real estate prices and show no real nexus to the casino, so it might be difficult to come in under one of those categories, but they are uh, certainly eligible. Um, now, the other thing is uh, typically our community mitigation funds go out to municipalities directly. Um, we do allow that government agencies or uh, districts may apply for funds for uh, projects that impact more than one municipality and that are these, these agencies are essentially um, acting on behalf of those uh, municipalities. Uh, next um, slide. Really. So what we've done now is, um, again, sort of for this pilot, we've targeted one project in Region A and one project in Region B. Um, we didn't do anything for the area around um, uh, a Plain Ridge Park, because uh, again, so this is sort of a pilot program. And you'll see we've earmarked $5 million for Region A and $3 million for Region B. And again, this goes back to what I said earlier, where more money is generated out of Region A than is out of Region B. Um, you know, we, we could have put more money in Region B, but with only 7 million available, we didn't want to, uh, you know, wind up being, you know, heavily oversubscribed. So, as we talked about in the transportation construction category, the Gaming Commission will only pay about a third, uh, up to a third of those costs. In this case, we're saying that we'll, we'll pay up to 15% of the project cost. So if, you know, in Region B, that means the, the overall project cost could be up to, you know, $20 million if we were funding the full 15%. And in the East uh, around Encore, it could be up to, 33, 34 million, somewhere in that order of magnitude. Um, and these projects, we realized that projects of this size um, take a bit longer to develop. Um, so um, so we, um, we're giving you two years to get these done. If you look at on our um, uh, transportation construction, we basically give you a year to get the project underway. This gives a little bit more flexibility because of uh, some of the difficulty in, um, you know, getting these the final uh, design on, on big projects like this done. Um, and questions, and I think I saw a couple of things yeah. pop up. Um, so from, uh, from Pioneer Valley, Eric Weiss uh, it says, as an RPA, we appreciate this category. Is it only one project per region or will the money be spread amongst various projects? So 
Our initial thoughts on this are that it would be one project in each region. But if we see, you know, I think we will, that would be sort of our baseline. You know, if, if multiple projects came in that were smaller in size and we could spread the money further, we might consider doing that. But I would say for our purposes right now, we would just assume it's one project per region. And then it says, in the case of housing, could the funding benefit slash assist a private developer? Um, that is a very good question. Um, I would say, you know, our guidelines talk about money going to private entities, and we have to, you know, under the, the Massachusetts Constitution, we have the what's known as the anti-aid amendment, which means that essentially uh, state funds can't go to a private entity unless that private entity is performing a public purpose or it's being done, the money is being used for a public purpose. So if the money were to go to a community and then it were to go to some other agency, um, it's, it's possible, but again, we would have to determine that that was being done for a public purpose. Um, and you know, the application would, would have to give us a pretty ironclad uh, argument on why it's a public purpose. Okay, any other, other questions regarding um, our projects of regional significance? Okay, I don't see any others. Um, Lily, I think you're gonna, uh, will you go through this? Uh... Yeah, uh, so I think just to wrap up here are some helpful links for folks. All of these um, have been emailed out to you. They're also all within the guidelines. They are also all on our website. So the first piece um, that you can look into is if you just go onto the Mass Gaming website under the Community Mitigation Fund, you can find lots of application options. You can find all the guidelines, all the different forms that we've referenced here today. Um, as we've all mentioned, please review the 2022 guidelines, or the 2023 guidelines, I apologize, that's a typo, um, because that is really where you're going to find the meat of what should be in your application. Uh, and then the third piece that we really want to try and hit home, um, I think our public safety applicants are very good at this. They frequently reference a report called the Christopher Bruce study that was done. But the Gaming Commission has done a lot of really great research and has partnered with a lot of really great folks across the state who have done a lot of really great research on the impacts of casinos and on gaming across the state. So if you're looking to do economic development grants, if you're looking to do different community planning grants, uh, there's a lot of research out there that could really help benefit your reports uh, and or your applications. And all of those reports are very easily searchable on our website um, by category and type. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, again, something we've all referenced, uh, you can see all of our uh, previous grant awards archived on our website throughout the years. So you can see what we funded previously. Uh, and while previous grant rounds do not indicate what we'll fund this time, uh, you know, we, we don't like to say that we're gonna fund something just because we funded it last year, um, but it's a pretty good indicator of things that were successful or arguments that were persuasive to the review team. We just didn't get another question pop up. Um, is there a reporting requirement after receiving the grant? And the answer to that is yes. Um, we have a um, we have a, uh, a quarterly report requirement. Um, so four times a year, you need to uh, submit to us on what your expenditures have been and and a little update on where your project stands. And uh, we do occasionally do. Uh, some outreach to our uh, grantees to sit down with them and talk about their projects and, and where things stand. We just had a call yesterday with one of our, our grantees on the status of their, uh, of their uh, grant. Um, so yes, there is definitely a, a reporting requirement. Uh, we did, uh, another question was, could a copy of the PowerPoint presentation be available either online or by request? Um, Mary, has this already gone up on our website? So yes. this is already up on our website, I'm assuming in the Community Mitigation Fund page. Um, and I believe we sent out um, a copy yesterday to, uh, to folks. Um, if you didn't receive it um, in an email yesterday, 
Um, you can all, and if you can't find it on the website, you can always email Mary or Lily and they can get you out a copy of it. Yeah. And speaking of which, there's our contact information. So uh, uh, if you do need anything from us, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, like I said, we're happy to uh, talk with folks. If you have ideas that you want to bounce off us, we're, we're, we're more than willing to, uh, to listen to what those are. Obviously, we can't tell you absolutely for sure that you'll get a grant or not, but uh, we, uh, you know, oftentimes people are uh, thinking outside the box a little bit and, uh, and, and we appreciate that. Okay, we did have a question, Joe. How much detail do you want on your quarterly reports? We have Lots. a quarter, <laughs> well, we have a quarterly report form which is attached to the gr grant that gets executed, and um, it really kind of depends on the type of application, uh, what the reporting requirements are, because there's some that are. Uh, have to be more in depth and show quantitative uh, quantitative results. Um, so it all depends on your your uh, the type of grant you have. Um, I can send you if you want. I can send you a sample of what the quarterly report looks like. And the quarterly report forms are also located on the community um, mitigation website under the um, yeah. there's just like it within our stuff. It just says forms, so you can click there for any and all of our forms. And I think, Mary, these are mostly typically a couple of pages. Of yeah, not, usually, not... usually it's it's just because uh, when you when you submit your quarterly report, if you need to request funding, you have to do it on that page as well. So usually it's the quarterly report form. And if you want a distribution, the distribution and any uh, backup information. All right. Are there any uh, final questions from folks out there? All right. Well, none appearing. I guess uh, I guess we will close out. Um, well, thank you all for for attending. I do appreciate yes, thank it. Thank you for coming. We um, appreciate it. You know, I hope this is helpful for you in in formulating some ideas for uh, for this upcoming round. And remember, January thirty first is our magic date for uh, submissions. So uh, so keep that in mind. Um, yep. And uh, happy holidays to everyone. Okay. Thank Bye. you.